2 Corinthians. How old are you, Todd? What? Did you say 24? Listen. You're sitting in a room that smells like Ben Gay, okay? So don't tell us about how bad it is to be 37. Lisa daubed something on my back last night. And yeah, I want to say it felt good. Took, I guess it helped with the pain. I couldn't tell. Because it was like it was like ice on fire on my back. I don't remember what it was. She said, this will help. So I guess it helped because I didn't feel the pain in my back anymore. I felt something different. 2 Corinthians 11. Something very, very important to look at this morning. All right? Very important to look at. Um, I'm going to look at verse 3 and 4. That's going to be kind of the focus this morning. We're studying uh, Satan, the, the Leviathan, the beast, the, the uh, devil, the serpent, the dragon, Satan, Lucifer. Uh, we're studying all the aspects of him and his nature and his character and what he does, how he does it, how to spot him, how to know um, in any situation in life where the devil's present. He is the exact opposite of God. God preserves. God preserves saints. God preserves his word. God has reserved certain things under the day of judgment. And then in the new heaven, the new earth, there is no corruption. No corruption. And just think, I don't know that you and I can really fathom what it's like or what it's going to be like to live in a, in a place and in a, an era where time does not work against us. Time does not work against our body. It does not work against the things that are around us. I mean, time just doesn't have the effect that things that the, the way we live right now has. Uh, Lisa has noted that uh, every time we take our camper out somewhere, something breaks on it. Or I break something on it. She's noted that. So the, the longer we have it, the less valuable it is. Because something else is broken on it. Something else ain't right on it. That's the corruption we live in. And I'm a big factor in that. So he says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. And by the way, let me just say this. It is natural for anybody who has oversight of anybody else, whether you're a parent or you're a pastor or anything else, it's natural to fear how people are doing and how people are turning out. It's natural, normal, okay? I mean, you guys experience that with your families. You experience it with children, grandchildren, so on. I experience it with family. I experience it with church people. I fear because I know how strong the devil is. I know how he works. I know what he does. And I know how he gets to people, okay? So it's, it's normal. Paul feared. And he warned those people how to avoid the, uh, the corrupter. Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted. Now notice the word there, corrupt. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So the work is corruption. The point of that work, or the fruition of that work, the goal of that work, is to remove men's minds away from the real gospel, the real Jesus, and the real spirit, over to a different one. Which is, and Paul made it plain in Galatians. Though he said another gospel, he said it's not another gospel. 
It's not good tidings of great joy. It's not good news. It's bad. And so anyway, um, Satan is the corrupter. Turn to Ezekiel 28. I have that up on the screen. But I want you to look at it in your Bible. Ezekiel 28 is one of those places that um, just sort of gives you a, a very good idea of the nature and the character of our enemy. It tells you about his beginning, where he came from, all right? Uh, how God made him. What was his beginning? His beginning, I'll say this, his beginning was far better than what his end is going to be. Anybody that follows him, their beginning is far better than their end. Their, their, the beginning of their life is far better than the end of their life. Okay? Anybody that follows him, let's say in church, uh, Peter said it. He said, the latter end shall be worse with them than the beginning. And if you just go all through the Bible, you see that. You'll see that. You hear me talk about Saul all the time. Go, read, st go study Saul's life. The beginning of Saul being named king of Israel, the beginning of that was, I mean, there was joy. There, he was prophesying with the prophets. I mean, he was preaching. He was, he, was just, he was just way up here as far as God is concerned. And you saw the decline in his life. I've seen that in people. I see it in this nation. We started up here, folks, and we're going to end down here. Okay, no doubt in my mind about it. Uh, but anyway, that is, that's how it works in the devil's realm. The beginning is always better than the ending. You turn that around and you point that toward God. When God does it, the ending is always better than the beginning. That's how you know what God did. Okay, latter end is always better than the beginning. Your second birth, better than your first one. Okay, and so... Um, so let me run this by you. When the scholars say that the Bible, the Word of God, was inerrant in the original manuscripts, but errors have crept in over time, and what we have now is not the perfect Word of God. What does that sound like to you? doesn't sound like the handwork of God, does it? Because God doesn't just start out perfect and then let it diminish over. That's not God. God's work is... The latter end is always better than the beginning. Though God gave a perfect word to the, His servants, the prophets, thousands of years ago, the final meaning of those words is more now than it ever has been in all of history. The culmination of what God is going to do, Jesus said in Hebrews 11 or Hebrews 10, that it's going to be by the book. And if it's by the book, what he ends with is far bit. When he came the first time, he did not perfectly fulfill everything in the word. When he comes the second time, he is. So the latter ends better than the beginning. All right. Now I want you to notice, I have a picture of a man up on the screen who is walking through fire. You ever seen anything like that? Remember that show, That's Incredible? Okay. Every now and then I'd get to watch that show because it came on Wednesday night. Wednesday night we were usually here. Okay, But they, that's the first time I ever saw them feature people walking across hot coals. And I'm going, how do they do that? That looks cool. Um, this is a common, in fact there is a, some kind of holiday in Japan where the Shinto religious people will do this every year. They will build beds of hot coals and they will walk across them. And when they get done, if they've done it, if they've done it right, there's no burn marks on their feet. There's no, they're not having been having to take the hospital, the burn unit, nothing like that. They walk across a bed of scalding hot coals with no damage to their feet whatsoever. Businesses, big corporations will hire new age gurus to come and teach their top employees, give them little mind games to play, and then have them walk across hot coals. This is commonly known. I have a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy written by a new ager and said that that's one of the practices. And she said, we are embedded. Our new age people are embedded everywhere. And we're teaching new age concepts 
We're teaching them in businesses and in government. We're teaching them in the pulpits. We're teaching them in the seminaries. We're in the schools. We're, we're writing magazine articles. We're putting out TV shows. We're everywhere. I believe her. Okay, I believe her. But anyway, what is the significance of this? I never made the connection until I was putting this together. Ezekiel 28. Look in your Bible. This is... Um, in fact, let me start out this way. Look at the beginning of Ezekiel 28. Notice that it is a prophecy to the prince of Tyrus. Now, the scholars and the commentaries... The Bible doubters will tell you, this is not about Lucifer. This is not about the devil. It clearly says this is written to the king or the prince of Tyrus, okay, the earthly king. Understand how your Bible speaks. Our wrestling is against principalities. The Bible is clearly teaching us that we're not fighting government, earthly government. We're fighting spiritual governments, spiritual entities, princes or principalities. Remember that, who was it? Michael the archangel fought against the prince of the people of Tyrus in delivering the message to Daniel. That's why he was delayed. What, 21 days he was delayed because he was fighting another spirit. He was not fighting an earthly king. He was fighting another spirit, the prince over, who is over the people of Persia. Michael, the archangel, is a prince over the people of Israel. He is a spirit that has authority over them. All right? Jesus is the prince of peace. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And so while you may have an earthly principality, you may have an earthly king, an earthly governor, an earthly mayor, anybody who is in any kind of authority on this earth, you, there will be a spirit ruling through them. All right? Does that make sense to everybody? Let's say that, um, hold, you know, pick any, pick any king or any monarch or any president, any governor anywhere in the world. There is going to be a spirit that governs through them. It's either going to be the Holy Spirit or it's going to be an evil spirit. Uh, Ephesians 2.2, 2, the Bible talks about the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So it's teaching you that there is a principality, a spirit that is working here. In this case, he is talking about the prince of Tyrus, the governor of Tyrus, the king of Tyrus here on this earth. But he is also referencing the spirit that works through this prince. Satan himself. So look at what it says. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up. Thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, In the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God, Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, For there is no secret that they can hide from thee. Now if you look at verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. This is describing Satan, the dragon, the serpent, uh, Leviathan, Lucifer. Um, thou, hast, um, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. God adorned Lucifer with beauty. It says in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, we know from the Bible that the serpent was in the garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering. Then it mentions the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. What, which one of you ladies and or men would not mind having a necklace that was full of Onyx and diamonds and emeralds and gold. Right? Beautiful. We're not talking about limestone. Nobody, nobody. What's your name back there, Ryan? Ryan does not come home from work 
having made a necklace of limestone, wearing it around his neck. Honey, look what I made today. Mom, look what I made. Okay? Just doesn't happen. He may have it in his ears. Okay? But he doesn't make a necklace out of it. Not much to look at. But the precious, precious stones was his covering. By the way, there's ten here. There's ten. Ten is always a number of dominion. And it represents the law. In this case, it represents the consequences of breaking God's law. Let's look at it. Uh, every precious stone was thy covering. Then it says, The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer had musical instruments built into him. Tablets and pipes. And if you think that's weird, if you think, Boy, that's just, that's just bizarre. Think of this. Um, when elk make a sound, what do we call that? Huh? Bugling. Why do we call it that? God gave them a built-in bugle. A built-in horn to make a sound with. All right? Birds. What do birds do? They sing. Beautiful songs. Pretty songs. Okay? God built a piccolo into these birds. Okay? Some of them he built foghorn in. Okay? But... He built music into these creatures, even grasshoppers and crickets and frogs. They all have their own song that they sing, all right? So it's not, not so, when you think about the creation, it's not so difficult to think then how God created this particular anointed cherub. He built him with music. In, in, his, in his being, in his substance, all right? So he knows music. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub. This is what I have on the screen. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. God gave him a high position. And I have set thee so. Thou, hast, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I've read a lot on this particular passage. Some say that that is uh, mountains in heaven. Some say that that is the planets that are in our system. That Lucifer walked up and down on those, the stones of fire. I don't know exactly what that is. But when I, I just was thinking about that and I remembered that there is a practice that involves humans literally walking on stones of fire. And when I thought about it, I, I just put the two together and I'm going, that's a satanic evil practice. Notice that there's nothing in our Bibles that requires us as born again Bible believing Christians to show our faith and our devotion to God by taking our shoes off and walking on hot coals. It's not, yeah, amen. There's nothing there that requires us to do that. Okay? But you can tell where his spirit is. His spirit is there with these practitioners who walk through these stones of fire and never have any burnt parts on their body anywhere. How do they do that? That's got to be a spirit like the one or the ones that was in the man who they called Legion. Who had supernatural abilities. When they bound him with fetters and chains. He simply broke them like they were nothing. And cast them aside. That devil possessed man had supernatural abilities. That's what I think is going on here. Amen. That's what I think. So whenever you see something like that going on. Uh, you know what spirit is present. If I were you, I'd stay far, far away from that. Amen? Now look in verse 15. Verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Notice that. Satan is not the creator. 
He is the created. He will always be that way. The create the created cannot take over the creator. Cannot do it. He thinks he can, but he can't. That was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. What was the iniquity? Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Means I got it in my mind one time that he's going to walk up and down these stones of fire one too many times. And he's going to get out in the middle of it and he's going to go, uh oh, this is not working anymore. I'm on fire. Thine heart, verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Ladies and gentlemen. Things that are appealing to our eyes, whether it be in a person or a thing, always lift the heart up with pride. Always. We get a new car, we don't keep our mouth shut about our new car. We got something nice in our house, we don't keep our mouth shut about something nice in our house. We want people to look either at us or at the things that we have. It is part of the vanity and the nature that is in this world. And Satan is the chief of that. God made him and adorned him to be the most beautiful of his creation. And what did he do with it? It corrupted him. It corrupted him. I mean, let's just, let's just play... Um, just kind of think about this. Let's say a woman. And she has put a lot into adorning herself. She makes herself look really good on the outside. She might have a surgery or two. She's had some injections. She's bought some hair. Bought this, bought that, bought the other. And she's really trying to put herself out there as some big beautiful, glorious thing. What's the danger of what could happen to her in her marriage? She's not just being looked at by her husband. She's being looked at by everybody else's husband and she knows it. What would that do? Corrupts the mind. It corrupts you start thinking, what am I doing with this jerk? I can have all these others because they're all looking at me. Okay? Men, same thing. Men, same thing. Okay? We can get corrupted by how we look or what we have or what we bought or whatever it is. The Bible's trying to, he's not just telling you the wicked nature of Lucifer. He's telling you the wicked nature of yourself. And see what happens in that case is you become like Lucifer. You know what you want? You want to dominate everybody and you are now your own God. You supply your own needs. You fulfill your own happiness. You do whatever it takes to please and honor you rather than honoring God. You're just like your father the devil. That's exactly what Jesus was getting at. You're like your father the devil. The Jews, their pride was in their temple. So what did God do with their temple? Destroyed it. And to this day, the Jews are still, to me, they're like an old, old, old movie star. Who just can't get over the fact that she's 88 years old. And the bikini doesn't look good anymore. But she still wears it. The Jews go to the wailing wall all the time and bow and pray to that shredded old remnant of what used to be. They're hanging on to what they used to have, which is nothing. And you know what God's going to do with that wall? 
He's going to tear the rest of it down. God is literally going to destroy every shred of everything that the Jews are hanging on to right now in order to get them to go to what he's got, something brand new. Okay? You ponder that. Because any of us, male or female, who start loading up pride either on how we look, what we do, what we have, or anything, where it draws people's attention to us. If you have Christ on the inside of you, you have something better than everything put together about what's on the outside of you. Amen? This lesson, God is telling you, don't follow Him. Because, look at verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now we learn at the beginning of this chapter, verse 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Now think about that. Lucifer, the covering angel, the covering cherub, near to the throne of God, was in on the plans of God. And he had wisdom that excelled every other angel, every human being. He had it. But then his pride and his beauty corrupted that wisdom. It became so corrupt that he did not recognize what he was doing when he entered into Judas Iscariot to go and betray Jesus so they would hang him on a cross. He thought that he was doing what was necessary to kill God so that he could have the inheritance. And his wisdom was so corrupted that he didn't, the Bible says, that God hid it from the principalities and powers, that God hid it from all of those evil angels. They couldn't figure out that in hanging Jesus on the cross, that was the very thing right there that was going to secure their damnation because God had the antidote for death. He was going to raise him back to life, more powerful and better than he ever was, and it was going to, it was going to absolutely destroy the kingdom of Satan forever. And he didn't see that. He never saw it coming. Even though it's very possible he could have known that before he was corrupted. But after he was corrupted, no way did he figure that out. Now I want you to ponder this for a minute. Okay? Where's our wisdom come from right now? You and I living on this earth, where is, where is our wisdom going to come from? Okay, God in experience. Amen to that. Okay, God teaching us through his word, right? And then when we run into those situations in life, we go, well, that's right there in the word of God. Okay, so that's how it works. What if you don't have the word of God? Can you get the experience? Can you get the wisdom? No. There are old people in countries all over the world who do not have the wisdom that old people in this country have because old people in this country used to have the Bible. Okay? It takes the Word of God. So what happens when Satan himself is corrupted? His spirit, wherever it is, it corrupts things. Corruption. Um, what happens when you leave food out? Spoils. What does the word spoil mean? Spoiled is a word given to armies who go in after they defeat a village. Spoil means that they take whatever those dead people had. They, it now belongs to them. That's spoiling. When food spoils, bacteria have entered in and taken what doesn't belong to them. And now it's of no use to us. Okay? That's, what that, that's where that word comes from. It's what it is. When things spoil, it's because it was stolen from us. Okay? And so take that now and apply that. Any Christian, any church, any denomination, 
any ministry, what can happen? Pride. Pride sets in over what they are doing or what they did. Pride sets in on how big they are. Pride sets in on how many people are following them, how much money is coming in, all of these factors. Okay? And what happens? When pride sets in, corruption sets in. Okay? I don't want that. I don't want it for me. I don't want it for this church. I don't want it. I want nothing to do with it. I've seen it happen. I've seen it take over. I'll use um, Thomas Road Baptist Church. You know where that is? You know what that is? Jerry Falwell's church. When Jerry Falwell started out, he was an old-time gospel King James Bible preacher. Okay? And by the time he died, he had become corrupt. He came out, if you remember, on September 12, 2001, and said to the nation, this is because of abortion and sodomy and every other ill thing in this country. God is lifting his hand of protection from this nation. Then he comes out five days later and has to apologize for what he said. You know why? Money. Some people that were big donors to his ministry and his college and all of his stuff and everything else probably made a phone call or wrote him and said, Oh, that was mean. That's all oh, that's terrible for you to say that. We don't know if we can support you any longer. So he comes out on national television and apologizes for what he said. I like the old Jerry Falwell, not the new one. And so now he's gone, he's dead, his son has taken over Thomas Rowe Baptist Church. And that and that university, I wouldn't, I wouldn't listen to them for nothing. Because now they brought in the rock and roll groups and all these false Bibles and all this news teaching and all this stuff. What happened? Got corrupt because of the money, because of the beauty, because of the pride. They got corrupt. It could happen to anybody and it could happen to me and I don't want it. Okay? I want nothing to do with it. But that's how it works. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And just to show you how big God still is up against who Lucifer thinks he is. He's going to try to take over the throne. Uh, turn to... Turn to Isaiah 14. I had a thought this week. I, I shared it uh, Thursday. Isaiah 14. Something just, it clicked in me. Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down the ground, which is weak in the nations? For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now look at that. He said that he would sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Or another way of saying it is on the north side. Okay? Turn to, um, turn to Ezekiel 1. It just, it just made sense. Just the other day. Ezekiel 1. Verse 26. Well, let's back up. Verse 4 of Ezekiel 1. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now notice the direction that this came from. It came from the north. Now look at verse 26. 
on these four living creatures was a firmament. That was the platform. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the appearance of the bow that was in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So here, coming out of the north, is God's throne. The Son of Man is sitting on it. And over that throne is a rainbow. And he says, that's the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And what did Lucifer just say that he wanted? I want to sit in the seat. In the sides, I want to sit in that chair. I want that to be my seat. Okay? That just clicked. I don't know why it took so long. But it did. Okay? Here it is coming out. Here's God coming out of the north in his throne. And here's Satan saying, see that, that seat of the congregation the sides of the north? That's where I'm going to sit. I will be like the most high. Okay? He is a corrupter. And every place that he is in is going to have corruption in it. Okay? Next Sunday morning... We're just going to go through the Bible, what the Bible speaks on corruption, things that become corrupt. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar realized that his sorcerers was giving him corrupt words. You know what that means? Sounds good at the first, never ends up being that way. Okay, It's like eating or drinking something that immediately tastes really good. Like sweet and low. I hate sweet and low. Amen. The pink stuff. I hate it. Because it may hit my tongue and pretend to be sweet for about 0.5 seconds. And after that, it's bitter. Ugh. I hate it. Ugh. That to me, that's what the devil does. Always starts out tasting really good. And then when it hits, it's bitter. It's corrupt. Okay? So you ponder that. Heavenly Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would help me. Help me, Lord, not be corrupt. Help me to not be corrupted. Lord, humble me. Humiliate me. Humble this church. Help us, dear God. Help us to strive together. Help us, dear God, to... Not have everything go our way. Lord, help us to depend on you. Father, I know what happens when things get going really well for us. I know it. And I thank you for it, God. Help us, dear God, to never forget who our God is. Help us never forget who our Maker is. And help us, Lord, to always worship you as such. Father, don't let us go corrupt here. And help us always to serve you, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.